trust in thee, O oh Lord. I put my trust in thee, O oh Lord. I put my trust. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. The mountains are His, the valleys are His, the stars are His handiwork too. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. The mountains are His, the valleys are His, the stars are His handiwork too. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. Let's pray together. Dear God, because you are amazing, we want to know you better. Please get us excited about just how great you are. Amen. Today's story is about the most incredible boat trip ever. There's never been another like it. Our story begins on the shores of the Lake of Galilee. Jesus had been out and about 
going from place to place, telling people about God's great love. After he'd finished talking to the people, he got into a boat with his disciples and said to them, let's go over to the other side of the lake. They boarded the boat and took their seats. Some of Jesus' disciples, Peter, James and John, were fishermen. So they knew all about boats and they also knew Lake Galilee very well. Peter, James and John had fished in the lake many times. Soon the boat was well away from the shore, heading out across the lake. It was a perfect day for a boat trip. Lovely blue sky, gentle breeze and the water was nice and calm. The shoreline soon disappeared. They hadn't too many miles to row now to get to the other side and with the experienced fishermen on board they would be there in no time. Jesus was tired after spending many days travelling around talking to the people. It wasn't long before he found a nice quiet spot at the back of the boat and settled down to sleep. The voyage was going really well. Or was it? Some dark clouds suddenly appeared in the sky, but Peter, James and John knew that the weather often changed quickly on the lake. So at first they were not too concerned, but maybe it was time to row a little faster. Very quickly, really strong winds started to blow across the lake and the water became quite rough. It was not easy to row with such large waves and the disciples were starting to become concerned. All was not well. The winds got stronger and stronger as the waves got higher and higher. They were now in the middle of a fierce storm. The disciples struggled to keep the boat under control. Things were not looking good. The boat was tossed this way and that. The disciples began to be afraid and worried. This was an unusually bad storm. What were they going to do? The waves threw the boat around as if it was a toy boat. The disciples were in big trouble now and they had completely forgotten about Jesus who was still fast asleep at the back of the boat. Their lovely quiet boat trip had turned into a disaster. What could they do? As the storm raged, all the time Jesus slept on. The waves were so big, water started to come into the boat. As the water weighed the boat down and it sank deeper into the lake, the disciples knew that they were in big trouble. They were terrified that they would drown. Suddenly, they remembered Jesus was with them. Jesus, Jesus, wake up, wake up. Don't you care we're going to drown? The disciples shouted. Jesus stood up in the boat and he could see how afraid the disciples were. Jesus spoke to the wind and waves, telling them to be still. The storm immediately stopped. The disciples couldn't believe their eyes. They were amazed. Jesus turned to the disciples and said, Where is your faith? The disciples said to one another, Who is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Sometimes life can get a bit stormy. Not with howling winds, and crashing waves, but things around us sometimes seem to go wrong. Maybe we have troubles with friends or at school. It could be that we feel lonely. Perhaps a friend or relative is sick. Jesus knows and cares about you. He was with the disciples in the boat on the rough sea when they even thought they would drown. The disciples learned a very important lesson that day. 
when they finally remembered that Jesus was with them. Let us remember that Jesus is with us too and we can always ask him for his help. Let's pray together. Dear God, because you are amazing, we want to know you better. Please get us excited about just how great you are. Amen.
Well, happy Valentine's Day. Thank you for joining us for our online service uh, this Sunday, the 14th of February. It's really great to have you with us wherever you are and whoever you are. For those who don't know me, my name is Tudor and I'll be uh, leading us uh, in this service. But there'll be many other people who are contributing as well. We have Reverend Dorothy Derrick leading the prayers, Claire Notman and Anne Abs giving readings. And this week uh, we have four songs which we haven't actually used uh, since we've been doing our online services. So four songs for our musicians to record and our singers to sing and put together. So again, big thanks to uh, Eric and Rosie Bryant, to Kat Cervante and uh, to Mark Rimmer and Joe and Vera, our singers, for their help in putting those together. Uh, Lent is about to begin. This Wednesday evening at 7.30 we've got a, a special online Lent service. Ash, Ash Wednesday service, some, a quiet, reflective one. It'd be great if you're able to join us for that time. And then for the Wednesdays following that, we, we're having a Lent course in place of Wednesday evening's EPL meetings. We'll be using some material to think through about the issues of identity and sexuality, linking in with a consultation the Church of England is doing on uh, called Living in Love and Faith. So those are things coming up in the near future, as yet there is no uh, plans for physical service to resume, but we'll keep you in the loop about those in due course. Well then, as we come to worship the Lord of all the earth, let me read a verse from Psalm, 100, sorry, Psalm 13, verse 6. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. In the light of that, let's pray together our opening prayer coming on the screen now. Heavenly Father, our ever-present help in trouble, our fortress and our God, calm the anxious fears of all who turn to you, give strength and healing to those who are sick, and courage and skill to those who care for them. Grant wisdom and clarity to those in authority, and humble us all to call upon you, that we may be saved not only in this life, but also for that which is to come, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God is our ever-present help in tri times of trouble. He's our refuge, he's our strength. He's not only the one who keeps us safe around the outside, he's the one himself who opens the gate to us, who opens the door. It's not by our goodness, it's by his grace. And it's by that security, that, that joy then, that we will sing our first song, Only by Grace Can We Enter. Let's stand and sing together. Only by grace can we enter only by grace can we stand Not by our human endeavor But by the blood of the Lamb Into your presence you call us You call us to come Into your presence you draw us And now by your grace we come now by your grace we come Lord if you mark our transgressions Who would stand Thanks to your grace we are cleansed By the blood of the Lamb Lord if you mark our transgressions Thanks to your grace we are cleansed by the blood of the Lamb Only by grace can we enter Only by grace can we stand Not by our human endeavor But by the blood of the Lamb Into your presence you call us, you call us to come, into your presence you draw us, and 
now by your grace we come. And now by your grace we come. Not by our human endeavour. It's God's work. Yes, of course, God gives us strength to serve him, but actually entering his presence, entering his family is by his grace alone. So none of us need to think, I'm not good enough. We come now to our first Bible reading, and it happens right at the start of the early church, just as the numbers are exploding there as the good news about Jesus is coming out. Yet even then, even then, there were injustice happening, and church structures would need to be reformed according to their new situation. So Anne Abbs is going to be reading from Acts chapter 6, verses 1 to 7. The Acts of the Apostles, chapter 6, the choosing of the seven, verses 1 to 7. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. This is the word of the Lord. The Christian life is one of transformation and reformation. Of both resting in God's grace and also saying, so what can that mean for me today? How can I do life today in the best way for God? And where today is different from yesterday, well, how can I do life differently? Sometimes though we both fall into habits of bad habits, but also habits of doing the same thing over and over again without actually thinking what's best for God. We put ourselves at the centre of life. And that's why it's so good to come in confession to God, to take hold of his grace, to ask his help. Let's then pray the prayer of confession coming on the screen. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us, according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We come in Jesus' name and therefore can know that we are forgiven because of his death and resurrection. So may the God of love and power forgive us and free us from our sins, heal and strengthen us by his spirit and raise us to new life in Christ our Lord. Well, our next hymn is one where we are no longer wrestling with the fact that actually we fall short of God's standards, because all of us do at times, but saying, well, what does that mean for us now? How can we go forward? Lord, how can you lead us a better way, a more excellent way? These words may not be so familiar for us, but the tune I hope will be. Let's stand together and sing, Lord, we know that we have failed you. Yes. 
Part of seeking the kingdom is, first of all, to know the king, the king whose kingdom will reflect his character. So we're now going to have the next uh, part of our uh, A to Z, our A to Z of God. And thanks to all those who have contributed towards this. Coming up on the screen now are a few of the uh, things that were coming, sent to us about the character of God. Let's take a look at those now. Which ones of those ring a bell with you? Which ones make you smile? Which ones make you hmm, ponder? God as empathic, knowing what we think. God as empathetic, actually knowing how we feel. God as eager, excited, expert, equipping, everlasting, extraordinary, extravagant. Well, we're going to hear now from Peter Ward as he picks up on one of those words and what it means to him.
Well, Peter, thank you for being with us uh, as we look at our E's for this A to Z. Um, so, Peter, you've said the word excellent. What, why did that word come to mind? What, what does it mean to you? I suppose something that happened when I went to visit our family who were helping lead a young people's camp a few years ago made me, th made me remember the old translation of some line, the, the beginning of Psalm 150 mm. um, in our school psalm book. Um, which went so uh, pray, uh, praise God in his holiness, praise him in the firmament of his power, praise him for his mighty works, praise him for his excellent greatness. And we were having a conversation um, with one of my sons about some teaching that was going to be given and the questions the young people were asking uh, and about um, what they should do about their dating and a lot of, and and you know how far you should go in your love making before you were married and all that sort of thing and 50 percent of the kids that were there were not churched kids mm. uh, and often had been in a bit of trouble yeah the as soon as you start talking about right and wrong, it, it opens the way to argue and dispute about shades of right and shades of wrong and circumstance and all the rest. And I, I, I said to my son, I said, I wonder whether it, it would be worth taking a leaf out of St. Paul's book. When he said to the Corinthians at a time of dispute, let me show you a more excellent way. Mm, yeah. Very interesting Greek word used, actually, but I can't remember <laughs> what it was. I just know it was, it, it takes you somewhere. But more excellent. And, and then I thought also, as the one, Psalm 150 that I've spoken of, and Psalm 8, I think it is, in some of the translations, O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Mm. And what an expansive word it is. Mm. It doesn't shut you down. It just invites you to come to go deeper. Mm. And that it's actually infinite. Mm. <laughs> you can't reach the end of it, of true excellence. But the excellence is no greater at the furthest reach mm. than it is when you first start bathing in it. Any more than water is any more water when you've gone to the deep end of the baths than it is when, you, when you're just splashing your feet. It's still 100% water. Thank you. That's really good. A uh, good illustration and a picture to, to finish us on for now. Yeah, bless you. Thank you so much. Well, God longs to, for us to join him on his more excellent way. He invites us. He opens the door. He is extraordinary. And we declare our faith now in the words of the Apostles' Creed in its responsive form. So let's take the time to stand, to say this is who we are. This is who he is, to celebrate who he's revealed himself to be in the Bible. Let's stand and say the Creed. Do you believe and trust in God the Father? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe and trust in his Son, Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. 
Do you believe and trust in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So let us express our faith as God's people together as we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen. Well, the Reverend Dorothy Derrick is now going to lead us uh, as we continue in prayers together. Let's pray with her. Loving God, be with us at this time of crisis when so many are suffering. We pray for your world, for the leaders of the nations, for the scientists, for the medics, for those who make decisions. We ask you to encourage a new sense of cooperation as we face the difficulties of the pandemic and these days of trial. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we pray for our nation. Give our leaders wisdom. Give our NHS strength to carry on. Give us all hope and courage in these difficult days. We thank you for the rollout of the vaccination programme. We pray for ourselves that we may continue to live lives of patience and love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we pray for your church throughout the world, remembering all who face persecution. We pray for our archbishops, for Justin and Stephen, for our bishops James and Emma, for our priest Tudor, and for all who are part of your church locally. Pour out your spirit upon them as your church finds new ways of ministering at this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we pray for all who are sick or in any kind of need. We pray for our hospitals, our care homes, and all who receive care in the community. We pray for all who work with them in so many ways. Give them extra strength to face each and every day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we bring before you any known to us who need your healing touch at this time. Especially we pray for those who are unable to receive visitors and feel that human touch of comfort. In a moment of stillness, we name them in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, this morning we hold before you those who have died, those who are known to us and those who are known to you alone. We give thanks for their lives. We remember that they have moved into your closer presence. We pray for all who mourn, that you will surround them with your light and your love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Finally, we pray for ourselves, that however dark it seems, we may see your light, remembering that Jesus is the light of the world. May we be filled with your light. May we share that light with others as we go forward in faith and hope and love. Merciful Father, I accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray together the Diocesan Coronavirus Prayer. Loving God, as your Son healed the sick and brought good news to the needy, be with us this day. Loving Jesus, as you taught us to do unto others as you would have them do to you, 
be with all in the caring professions this day. Loving Spirit, your gift is healing. Bring your healing fire to our homes, our hospitals and our country. But most of all, be with us this day. Amen. The Apostle Paul lamented that I do what I do not want to do and I do not do what I want to do. Each of us is a, a battleground, aren't, aren't we? Actually, warring emotions, warring passions, warring desires. We long to please God in all we do, to do what's right, and yet we struggle with sin. Thankfully, God is merciful and kind. In fact, he adopts us into his family if we trust in Jesus. And that's why our next hymn is entitled Abba, Father. Abba means father or, or dad in Aramaic. It's the word Jesus used. So we can use that of God himself, that personal connection. Let's use this song as a prayer before we come to our main Bible reading and sermon. Let's sing, Abba Father, let me be. As we want to be God's and God's alone, then we're going to come under his living word. We're going to come to see, well, how he wants us to live, who he is. And I find, when I'm reading my Bible, hugely comforting that when we actually read what the Bible says, we find it's not full of heroes that we can never match up to. No, the Bible is full of people who God still uses, despite their failures, despite their shortcomings, as he works out his grand plan for the love of all humanity. A, a, a merely Sunday school view of the Bible is of Noah, the hero, building the ark. David, the hero, killing Goliath. Peter, the hero, walking on water. But when we read the Bible as a whole, we see that Noah got into trouble through his drunkenness. David committed adultery and murder. Peter was a coward and made countless errors. So if, like me, you're all too aware of your spiritual shortcomings, your lack of prayer, lack of love, lack of courage, and those idols that keep dragging you, tempting you away from God, well, then listen in. Last week's chapters at the end of the book of Nehemiah, chapters 11 and 12, were a kind of a mountaintop moment for God's named people, named and loved by him. They trusted God, they obeyed him, and they enjoyed the fruits of faith. And if Disney, if Disney owned uh, the book of Nehemiah, the rights, they would cut out the final chapter, chapter 13, because they wanted to keep going with the happily ever after. In today's chapter, 
we find that the people are back down from that mountain top. They're back in the valley again. So why didn't Nehemiah stop his book, this, this memoir of key points in his life earlier? Why did he finish on a disappointing note? Well, I think it's because God wants to help us to have faith in real life. Real life when highs fade, when struggles continue, when we need to be equipped to keep following him anyway. So we're going to go through this chapter bit by bit. Claire Notman is going to be reading for us from Nehemiah 13. Listen out then how faithful Nehemiah seeks to bring the people back to the commitments they'd made earlier in the book. And listen out for the kind of things, the questions we should be asking and what we can be doing as we live in the grace of God. Nehemiah chapter 13 verses 1 to 3, read by Claire Notman now. On that day the book of Moses was read aloud in the hearing of the people, and there it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever be admitted into the assembly of God, because they had not met the Israelites with food and water, but had hired Balaam to call a curse down on them. Our God, however, turned the curse into a blessing. When the people heard this law, they excluded from Israel all who were of foreign descent. Well, the events of this chapter happened perhaps 20 years after the previous chapter, when all the right rules and patterns were in place. We learn in verse 6 that Nehemiah had completed his first term as governor, then returned to the king's court in Babylon, and sometime later returned to Jerusalem, having possibly secured a, a second term as governor there. But when Nehemiah returned, he found a range of big problems, because rules cannot change our hearts. We'll see that all of these problems were to do with God's people following the world's ways rather than God's ways. Following the world's ways rather than God's ways. Now it is vital for us to have a, a right relationship with the world. God called all Christians out of the world and into his family in Jesus. We are made holy, meaning set apart or, or different. But that doesn't mean we separate ourselves from the world like, a, like cults often do. A picture I, I can find helpful is that of a, of a lifeboat and the sea. Uh, it's good for a lifeboat to be in the sea offering rescue, but it's not good for the sea to be in the lifeboat, else it can sink and can't save anybody. We Christians, you see, are to be like a lifeboat. We're in the world but not of it. We're not to fill ourselves with what the world does. We're to be different, distinct, but still there with people. In the Bible, God shows us how to live for him amongst people who don't know him, how to be light in the darkness, being different, to show what God is like, to show his goodness, to show his mercy, his wisdom, and his love and his rescue. But when Nehemiah returned from Babylon, he found big problems because the lifeboat of God's people had been shipping water and some serious bailing out was needed. Now, all of us face small daily choices, don't we? Choices which affect the direction of the travel of our lives in the long term, because many little choices add up to big change. Just as if we uh, tolerated warm drips and dribbles, well, if we keep doing that, will end up floating in a puddle without realising it. Just so, in the same way, making small compromises time and time again gets us used to pleasing the world rather than pleasing God. And if that's the case, well, we need to get out our bucket and start bailing out. In verses 1 to 3 of our passage, God's word showed the people they'd gone wrong in letting false beliefs insidiously infiltrate society. This is our first bucket load we've got to get rid of. False beliefs insidiously infiltra infiltrating society. Now, on the face of these verses, they, they're great with us, don't they? They look deeply racist against Ammon and Moab. But in context, this law from Deuteronomy isn't actually about race. It's about those who are following follow, for foreign religions. After all, if you know your Bibles, you'll know that Ruth 
is celebrated. Ruth, who is a Mer by test, she comes from Mer, she's celebrated as a woman of faith because she changed from following the faith of the Merbites to following the one true God, and she became King David's grandmother. So this law is about allowing unbelief to go unchallenged and become the law norm. It's about stopping that happening. I guess it's a bit like food. When we realise that a certain type of food is actually much worse for us than we thought, well, the right reaction is to rid our spiritual diet uh, of, uh, uh, rid ourselves of it. In a similar way, the right reaction is to rid our spiritual diet of the influence of people who don't trust the one true God. Now, uh, all humans, whatever they believe, are precious creations of God. And, of course, wisely engaging with other beliefs has its place. But we must not affirm those false beliefs. We mustn't say the differences don't matter. We must not worship with them. Because that is spiritually poisonous to God's people. And actually, it's spiritually poisonous to those who don't follow the one true God. Because then they get the idea that they don't need to, to turn to him in faith. When actually, every one of us does. However nice someone is, and there are many, many nice non-Christians, often nicer than many Christians, everyone needs Jesus. Being nice is the, the wrong measure of things. I guess uh, this bucket then, this making sure that unbelief doesn't have too much influence over us, is a challenge uh, in very practical ways. For instance, are our churches more interested in fitting in to our community and keeping the rest of the community happy than showing them Jesus? Would we rather ship water rather than show the distinctiveness, the wonder of Jesus? I guess by not speaking about Jesus, do we give our family, friends and neighbours the impression that faith in Jesus doesn't matter? Are we discerning about our own spiritual diet? Do we listen and watch and read many more things by unbelievers than by Christian believers? And so let their worldview, their view of life, shape us. So easy, isn't it? Note, it, note how it was reading God's word that showed God's people their need to change their lives. Unless people hear and see they need a change is needed, they won't realise it. We don't know it naturally. And so, do we regularly read the Bible so God can help us in the same way? Well, this first need to bail out comes from reading God's word themselves. The other bailouts in the chapter come from Nehemiah bringing them back to obedience to God's word. Just like a true friend does to get their be the best of us back on track when we have made mistakes. Before this, Eliashib the priest had been put in charge of the storerooms of the house of our God. He was closely associated with Tobiah and he had provided him with a large room formerly used to store the grain offerings and incense and temple articles and also the tithes of grain new wine and olive oil prescribed for the Levites, musicians and gatekeepers, as well as the contributions for the priests. But while all this was going on, I was not in Jerusalem, for in the, thir for in the 32nd year of Artaxes, king of Babylon, I had returned to the king. Some time later I asked his permission and came back to Jerusalem. Here I learned about the evil thing Eliashib had done in providing Tobiah a room in the courts of the house of God. I was greatly displeased and threw all Tobiah's household goods out of the room. I gave orders to purify the rooms and then I put back into them the equipment of the house of God with the grain offerings and the incense. The next matter then, the next bucket, next thing we need to bail out is a matter of power and corruption power and corruption. In the rest of Nehemiah, the book we've already covered, we've seen how this man, Tobiah, had all the right connections by marriage and by business relations. Tobiah, however, was an Ammonite. He was opposed to God's purposes and time and time again he used those connections to hinder and to intimidate Nehemiah. Now Nehemiah returns from Babylon to find that Tobiah has secured himself a business address in the temple itself. 
after it seemed to everyone else that he had God's approval. This is just not on. Eliashib, the uh, high priest, back in chapter 3, he was the first person named as rebuilding the wall. But now, even though God used him then, after 20 years of little compromises, we read twice in this chapter how Eliashib is now being used against God. In verse 7 we read that he had done an evil thing, giving Tobiah more influence and misusing a room that was made to be holy for God. I guess we need to watch out for this in ourselves, don't we? I wonder if there are people whose connections and experience mean they are very influential in our communities, in our churches. Are there times when a, a suggestion is made and people say, oh no, no, we can't do that because it would offend so-and-so? If that happens, maybe a, a warning light needs to go on. Because whatever good things those people have done, such influence can be dangerous. And if we think in terms of the, the temple room itself, I wonder if we have church structures, committees and buildings that are, are not working the way God intends them to. Are they, are they fit for purpose still? Or have they got off track? What, what spring cleaning do we need to do to make holy and use what God has set aside for that purpose? Well, that bailout, that change may need to be sudden. It may need to be shocking. Can you imagine the, the impact of Nehemiah throwing all Tobias' goods out of those misused rooms? before having them purified, rededicated for God's intended purpose. It would have been shocking, wouldn't it? But of course, remember, Jesus himself did something similar in the temple courts, turning over the benches, driving the people and animals away, sometimes making a, a public spectacle, as we are reformed by God's word, shows us, shows the world that God comes first. As we put out of ourselves, the world we build, the water of the world that's come in. Because otherwise, that water could sink us. I also learned that the portions assigned to the Levites had not been given to them, and that all the Levites and musicians responsible for the service had gone back to their own fields. So I rebuked the officials and asked them, why is the house of God neglected? Then I called them together and stationed them at their posts. All Judea bought the tithes of grain, new wine and olive oil into the storerooms. I put Shilamai, the priest, Zadok, the scribe, and Levite named Padiah in charge of the storerooms and made Hanan, son of Zakur, the son of Mataniah, their assistant, because they were considered trustworthy. They were made responsible for distributing the supplies to their fellow Levites. Remember me for this my God, and do not blot out what I have so faithfully done for the house of my God and its services. Well, the third bucket load of things to get rid of, the third bucket bailed out to keep God's people afloat, was their failure to trust and prioritise worship to the one true God. Now, typically, the world gives it gives at all from its spare change, its, its leftovers. But Christian giving, Christian giving comes generously first of all, the, the first fruits, the tithe, the first of what we got before we have our daily living. And we, we work out, well, how can we live on the rest of what we've got? We give and then we trust that God will provide what we need after that. It, it seems that God's people in this passage who back in chapter 10, verse 39, had promised to be generous, had promised not to neglect the support of God's worship, well, they've now gone back on their word. In verses 10 to 14 of our chapter, we see they had failed to provide for the ministers that God had provided for them, to teach and care for them. And to be honest, in a way, we are not much different today, here. Our six parishes have a full-time vicar. But actually, we in our parish offers only pay about a half of my cost. To date, the gap between what our parishes pay and, and what it costs for the house and my pension and things like that 
Well, it's been filled from other parishes in Cumbria. But all of our parishes are struggling. The diocese as a whole is struggling. And we don't know what will happen soon. It might be that my time might be cut if we don't trust God more and give more generously. I have no idea, of course, about who gives or how much do you give. And Lord, I want to, but God knows our hearts. And it might be that this passage challenges us about our giving, about how we support God's work, what priority we give it. Maybe we need to ask, are we displaying our trust in God's provision by having a standing order and committing a, a certain percentage of our annual income to God come what may? Does our giving in finance and time, does it reflect God's generosity to us? Does it show our commitment in being sacrificial that we actually forego other things for God's sake rather than having that spare change mentality? That issue of commitment is also shown in the fourth bucket, the fourth issue that Nehemiah uh, addresses, or that's addressed now. In those days I saw people in Judea treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in grain and loading it on donkeys together with wine, grapes, figs and all other kinds of loads. And they were bringing all this into Jerusalem on the Sabbath. Therefore I warned them against selling food on that day. People from Tyre who lived in Jerusalem were bringing in fish and all kinds of merchandise and selling them in Jerusalem on the Sabbath to the people of Judah. I rebuked the nobles of Judah and said to them, What is this wicked thing you are doing, desecrating the Sabbath day? Didn't your ancestors do the same things, so that our God brought all this calamity on us and on this city? Now you are stirring up more wrath against Israel by desecrating the Sabbath. When evening shadows fell on the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath, I ordered the doors to be shut and not opened until the Sabbath was over. I stationed some of my own men at the gate so that no load could be brought in on the Sabbath day. Once or twice the merchants and sellers of all kinds of goods spent the night outside Jerusalem. But I warned them and said, Why do you spend the night by the wall? If you do this again, I will arrest you. From that time on they no longer came on the Sabbath. Then I commanded the Levites to purify themselves and go and guard the gates in order to keep the Sabbath day holy. Remember me for this also, my God, and show mercy to me according to your great love. Here we see Nehemiah bailing out the floundering lifeboat of God's people. In verses 15 to 22, he addresses the issue of the Sabbath. Now, it was God's command to set aside one day a week when work would not be done, to enable worship together and refreshment and display trust in God's provision. For the Jews, that was Saturday. But Jesus made it clear that the Sabbath principle is for our good and it's not there to bind us. It's not a a rule that, that ties us down, it's there to free us up. It's good for us. Christians have traditionally use Sunday as Sabbath, in memory of Jesus' resurrection, but we can use another day. That means that shift workers uh, can choose a day that suits them uh, to, 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 to actually worship God on that day instead. The point is that we are choosing to display our trust in God in our diary. If we don't trust God, then we may feel we have to work every minute because our security rests on our efforts. And that work not, isn't just paid work, it can be our voluntary things too. Or if we desire wealth or fitness or, or family more than we desire God, well then we'll sacrifice meeting each week with his people for whatever idol our greater love is. That'll be the reason that we don't, aren't, aren't part of a church gathering every week. Nehemiah used his influence to clamp down on distraction and to to free up worship opportunity in Israel at the time. It's quite amusing, isn't it, that picture of some of those merchants sleeping outside in the hope of getting in to make more money. It's amusing, but in a sad and somewhat desperate way. Nehemiah used his influence and Sunday trading laws have been there, uh, but laws can't change people's hearts. Each of us, every one of us, has significant choices over our diary. Whether or not we practice Sabbath, 
whether or not uh, we engage with church services and other online gatherings. You see, if we can't physically drive, it's more difficult to physically get to, to physical services. If we have no internet, then some online events are more difficult. But there are ways, if we're willing to try and ask. We as a church will always help one another to manage what we can. The sad thing, the distressing thing, is when people choose not to worship together. Who choose not to grow in faith together when we easily could. Well, what does that say about our heart and our love of God? In Hebrews, God urges his people to not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but instead to encourage one another. Whoever we are, our presence with others, even if we say little, is a great encouragement. And in the last nine months, I've been really encouraged by the good number of people who have done their best with Zoom and with Facebook. But I've also been saddened and discouraged by those who are unwilling to do what they can. So what does our Sabbath and our church practice say about our love of God and his people? What place has sacrifice of going uh, beyond our comfort zone gone? Of course, in lockdown it's hard, isn't it? It's hard to distinguish one day from another. And in some ways then, it's even more important for us to have a Sabbath, to decide which things we will not do on a set day and what we will do instead for the glory of God. As you think about your life, I wonder what God might be prompting you to refrain from and what things to commit to, particularly as we approach Lent. Well, little choices, one following another, have a big impact, both positively and negatively. In the Bible, that's seen disturbingly in the life of King Solomon. Solomon was given great wisdom and great wealth by God. I mean, some of his words were inspired by God and they're recorded for us in Proverbs and possibly the book of Ecclesiastes too. And in there, Ecclesiastes, it shows that he knows that the world's ways are futile. And yet, and yet Solomon followed the way of the world in his marriages. He made politically astute marriages, alliances through them, but because he was trusting in those, they displayed a lack of trust in God and they led to him being complicit in idol worship, in having children who did not trust God. That's what can happen when those little choices come to us. And we don't deliberately choose God's ways, choose his time. And that brings us to bucket number five, the final section, the final issue that we're in Nehemiah's bailed out of God's people. Moreover, in those days I saw men of Judah who had married women from Ashad, Ammon and Moab. Half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod or the language of one of the other peoples and did not know how to speak the language of Judah. I rebuked them and called curses down on them. I beat some of the men and pulled out their hair. I made them take an oath in God's name and said, You are not to give your daughters in marriage to their sons, nor are you to take their daughters in marriage for your sons or for yourselves. Was it not because of marriages like these that Solomon, king of Israel, sinned? Among the many nations there was no king like him. He was loved by his God, and God made him king over all Israel. But even he was led into sin by foreign women. Must we hear now that you too are, are doing all this terrible wickedness and are being unfaithful to our God by marrying foreign women? One of the sons of Joedah, son of Elisha, the high priest, was son-in-law to Sanballat the Horonite, and I drove him away from me. Remember them, my God, because they defiled the priestly office and the covenant of the priesthood and of the Levites. So I purified the priests and the Levites of everything foreign and assigned them duties, each to his own task. I also made provision for contributions of wood at designated times and for the first fruits. Remember me with favour, my God. And it's a repeat of bucket number one. 
but in people's homes. You see, in verses 23 to 29, we see that marrying unbelievers had led to children who couldn't even join in tree worship because they'd never been taught the language. Their culture was that of the other nations, their beliefs the same. And sadly, many children now in our parishes don't know the language of faith because their parents, including some of us, didn't bring them up with it. It was unspoken. Now, none of us are perfect in this area. But Nehemiah urges us to do what we can. And so a key question for us as churches is how we can teach the language of faith in our communities, in our churches, yes, but also through our schools. I, I do have opportunities in our schools, but I'd love this to be a team effort, not just me. For our churches to have a, a heart for this, for even if as individuals we don't know how we could contribute ourselves, to say, I, I want to be involved, I want to support this, how can I? And also let's support one another within our church families too. Because how much kindness and love there is in a marriage between a believer and a non-believer, it will still be hard that, at the deepest level, they are, they are facing the opposite directions. So for those in our church families who are married to those who don't believe in Jesus, well, let's look out for and support them and let's, let's look for support if that's our situation. One of my sadnesses with the Church of England is that, like, like Eliashib, the high priest, in verse 28 of our passage, the institution has little or no concern as to whether the spouse of ordinands are believers or not. Now, being a minister by nature involves some loneliness of leadership, but how much more is that magnified by having an unbelieving spouse? It must be a huge burden and it's not good a model for the church either. In verse 29, in his day, Nehemiah got the spiritual leadership of God's people back on track. He ensured that God came first in the family life of the ministers, as well as worship, verse 31, being done according to God's word. I wonder how you think our spiritual leadership, our PCCs, our wardens and myself and others, how our leadership and our practices could be reformed to be more pleasing to God. Actually, the, the wonder of being a Christian is that all of us are works in progress. And so we should be saying, well, well how can I uh, walk more in God's ways? Help me, help us help one another as a teamwork, not, be, not to feel criticised by it. But say, well, how can we get better in God's ways? As I said at the start, I find it encouraging that everyone in the Bible, everyone in the Bible, apart from Jesus, makes mistakes. We make mistakes, they make mistakes, they failed, they sinned. Because, you know, that's the situation I'm in too, and all of us listening. If you and I had a spiritual school report, all of us would have down written, could do better. But that's not what matters most of all. It's not our deeds that get us into God's book, book, good books. We're not, nor am I celebrating our weakness in itself. But actually our weakness magnifies the mercy and strength of God, who loves us regardless, who makes up for all shortcomings. Because with Jesus, if we read Jesus' report, it would say, outstanding, no room for improvement. For Jesus, through his incarnation, his death and resurrection, he chose to walk in our shoes, to die for our sins, to rise to new life so that we can too, if our hope's in him. Although, of course, our deeds will have consequences now, Jesus' mercy covers all our failures and all our slips. So whether we, as you listen to this, are on a spiritual mountaintop or in the valley of the shadow of death, God's right hand is holding us fast. We're, we're safe in him. We are eternally loved. Now, until Jesus returns to make all things new, we're going to continue to struggle, aren't we? We'll struggle against sin, against the world and the devil. And whilst we always have reasons for gratitude to God, we'll also constantly be in need of further reformation by the Holy Spirit through the word of God. There will continue to be leaks in the lifeboat of our church. Things will continue to come in. 
and we'll need God to point them out to us through his word, through one another. And we'll need to, to bail out the bills of the, the world that come in, that's come into our life, that's come to the church. All of us are works in progress, so let's keep working in God's strength. For whilst we heed the warning of Solomon and the warning of Eliashib, how they fell from their high positions, let's, we do stand uniquely secure in Jesus. And by God's spirit, we can follow Nehemiah's example of faithfulness, of persevering through the high times and the low. So then let's prayerfully rest in God, using our energies, however much or little they are, for his glory. Whatever our situation, let's bail out the lifeboat that he has pulled us into, and let's help others come into out of the storms of life. Let's pray now. O oh, Father God, the sea captain of our souls, we praise you for the rescuing of the gospel and the lifeboat of your church. Forgive us for when we allow the world's bilge into your church. Help us to heed your warnings and together bail sinful priorities and practice out so that we may better honour you and enjoy you and be the people of rescue and renewal that you've saved us to be. In the name of Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray this. Amen. I certainly need my uh, jumper for recording that. It's chilly outside, isn't it? God is great. He's gracious. He's glorious. He's so forgiving and kind. He gives us everything we need. Through this pandemic, he's brought us to this point and he will never let us go. And he's uh, enabled us to be those who reach out with his good news as we rest in it ourselves. Please do be praying for our church leadership as we enter this time of Lent and think forward about what might be happening, what might happen in the next uh, three, six months to a year and beyond, as we plan what uh, our response could be. And please do be praying for yourselves too about how you can be part of that. For those on my email list, I'll be sending out an invite quite soon to invite you to an opportunity to, to brainstorm and input into what God might be doing and how we can plan for the future that he has stored out for us, even when we don't know what it is right now. Well, I hope you can join us for our Lent uh, course in two weeks' time. But our Ash Wednesday service this Wednesday, 7.30, via YouTube and Facebook, as usual. It'll be great if you can join us for that. Straight after this service, we'll have our normal Zoom time, where we uh, catch up with one another, pray for one another, uh, chat about the service a bit more. If you want to get involved, details uh, for my phone number and email are there. Please drop me a line or an email right now and I'll send you the link to tell you how to log into that. Before our closing song then, let's pray together the prayer on the screen. Loving God, we thank you for hearing our prayers, feeding us with your word and encouraging us in our meeting together. Take us and use us to love and serve you and all people. Amen. We close with a classic to reshape our hearts, to lift them again to where they should be, the throne of God by his grace. To God be the glory, great things he has done. Let's stand and let's sing with great joy and encouragement as we go out from here as his people.
the Father, through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. O perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, to every believer the promise of God. difficult time when our church buildings are closed, we're still a church, meeting virtually for prayer services and fellowship, loving our neighbours by offering practical support to the vulnerable, and caring for our communities. The work of our church is reliant on people's generosity, a generosity that is a hallmark of a lived out faith and a testament to it. We give to our church in a variety of ways but with the closure of all our buildings, we cannot receive all the gifts that we usually would. So we really need your help now. If you're able to give more at this time, here's how you can help. Precious in my eyes 
perfect love. Do not be afraid.